Today I'm joined by Sue Chalman Anderson, founder of Ada Lovelace Day. So Sue, today we're going to be talking about how to make your passion project your job, how to make it pay for your ideally day-to-day living in some comfort. Uh, So to get us started, how did Ada Lovelace Day begin and how did that turn into finding Ada? So Ada Lovelace Day uh, really started in the sort of mid-noughties. I was very much, I was in the tech industry, going to a lot of conferences, getting very fed up of not seeing women on stage and also getting kind of fed up of the fact that when Even women who were aware of the problem when we were talking about, you know, who are the women in tech you would like to see on stage, we were still struggling to really name people who weren't our direct friends. So there there just wasn't the visibility of women at sort of CEO level, CTO level. They just weren't getting the the attention that, that they should have, that their male counterparts were getting. And so the first Ada Lovelace Day started, it was in 2009, 24th of March, 2009. And it was a day of blogging about women in technology. And the idea was that if we all wrote blog posts about the work of women that we admired, that we would start to sort of create new stories, create new role models, and and elevate the profile of, of women in tech. And it pretty much immediately expanded into a day of blogging about women in STEM. I remember some of the blog posts were about people like Marie Curie or Florence Nightingale. And I thought, oh, there's clearly a broader need here for it to be STEM focused. And it sort of evolved over the years really to be, you know, from a day of blogging to being a day of events. So we have an event in London every year and people put on their own events every year, all around the world. I mean, literally on every continent. It's quite amazing. And then we're sort of, you know, that we have a slightly sort of split brand in a way because Finding Ada is our URL and our, um, our brand on Twitter. And Ada Lovelace Day is the day. So Ada Lovelace Day is the one day where we get together, but Finding Ada is kind of all the other work that we do all year round because it has gone from being something that I do kind of for a month or so once a year to being my full-time job. And that's really interesting. So it started as an event and it started as an event that was really online focused, really blogging and scaled up into something that exists all over the world. And now it's something that's become your full-time job. I think a lot of our listeners, maybe even you, dear listener, have a passion project or a side project they really love in technology. But what kinds of things are you doing to turn that into a job that pays? It, it's been a very slow, gradual process. I, I never imagined that it would actually become my full-time job. I just, that wasn't why I started it and, and it wasn't my initial expectation. I mean, if I'm honest, my initial expectation would be that it would happen once and then that would be it. It was a surprise to me the next year when I found myself organizing the second day to Lovelace Day. <laughs> Honestly, I mean, it sounds kind of dark now, but I didn't really expect that to happen. And then each year, it just organically grew. And so when we started doing Ada Lovelace Day Live, which is I like to describe as a sort of science cabaret, where we get, okay, of, it's like seven or eight women from across STEM in the UK doing really short 10-minute talks about their work. And it's really about showcasing UK talent and, and showing people, you know, this is what women are working on. This is what they're achieving so that it becomes more about an evening of entertainment where you sort of accidentally learn some stuff about women in STEM. So it's, it's kind of maybe a, a little bit of sort of stealth activism, you know, come out, have fun, learn something, and oh, by the way, all the speakers are women. And so that we started in 2011. And then since then, I mean, the blogging aspect has dropped away, I think, because blogging has become much less fashionable. People don't do it so often. The events. I've apparently not gotten that memo. I'll, I'll <laughs> add that to my bank of knowledge. Blogging, not cool anymore. No, well, you know, there's, there was this whole period where every week there was a, is blogging dead article? And, you know, some people still do it, but there's definitely been a fall away. You know, a lot fewer people engage in that side of things. And a lot more people are organizing face-to-face events for their local communities. And they do all sorts of things. We don't control it. We don't tell them what to do. We do have an organizer pack and we do encourage people to sort of sign up to our values, if you like. 
but it's really grown quite organically. And what I realized about three years ago was that we needed some revenue somehow. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, because, you know, we, the costs of putting on Ada Lovelace Day live are not covered by the ticket sales, not even slightly. And you can't, even at £20 for a full price ticket, and with very generous kind of early bird discounts and concessions, you know, it's still quite hard to convince people they want to come out to a science event in London. So there's no way that's ever going to be a money spinner. I started getting a little bit of sponsorship here and there. Actually, the Biochemical Society was probably our first sponsor in, oh gosh, maybe 2012, something like that. And so I kind of started to see that there was an opportunity for sponsorship there. But sponsorship is, is very difficult, and it's even harder now in this kind of very uncertain economic climate. It's been very difficult this year to get new sponsors. And so I've really spent the last two years especially looking at and testing different income streams. And it's been, it's been an eye-opener. It's been very much a learning process. And I think that this process is going to be something that sounds really familiar to a lot of people working on open source projects, working on community conferences, working on nonprofit projects, this very early process of let's try this thing and see if people like it. Oh, wow, people like it. Oh, dear, we should probably get paid for doing some of it. Let's try sponsorship. And that, like you said, there are a lot of challenges there. Did you go further? Is there anything you tried out after sponsorship that might be useful? Well, we've tried quite a lot of things, actually. Um, The problem with sponsorship is it's very lumpy as an income stream and it can cause some (laughs) significant cash flow problems. You know, I tend to find, especially this year, most sponsorship came right at the last minute. I mean, literally kind of in in the two weeks before Ada Lovelace Day. In fact, the week before Ada Lovelace Day, we got our final confirmed sponsor. And that's kind of really cutting it fine. And so what happens is that when you're doing a sponsored event, once people have signed up for this year, the future is a foreign land to them. And it's not until you're kind of in that crucial period before next year's event that people will go, oh, yeah, yeah, no, we meant to do oh, this yeah, month Oh, yeah, Ada Lovelace yeah. is a thing. It is, and we, we yeah, and that's great. You know, I'm, I'm really grateful that they do actually make a decision, but it does mean that it makes it very hard to do any kind of financial planning to, say, commit to freelancers. I have a couple of freelancers who literally do just a couple of hours a month because I, I don't have the financial transparency in my own income to commit to more. And I don't want to be saying to people, yes, you know, I could really do with you working kind of 16 hours a week. Oh, we've run out of money. Uh, That sounds like it adds additional stress to you, but does let you sort of move forward and interact with your contractors in a really responsible way. Yeah, it is stressful because I think, you know, I take my responsibility to to people very seriously. So I, I do get a lot of the, oh, just get some volunteers to do it. And that I'm not keen on on that route for for a number of reasons but the first one of which is if your mission is to empower women asking them to work for free is maybe not in line with that mission so you know I've been looking for some time for reliable income streams and I think one of the challenges is that um, we all have our strengths we all have the thing that we like to do and my first thought is always content and merchandising. And so that, that the first thing that I tried was I put together an anthology of, of biographies. And, and this was, you know, very generously, people did donate their time to this, but I got about 20 biographies of women in STEM, put them together in ebook, edited them up, published, self-published them on Amazon, and then nothing. I mean, oh, no. <laughs> sales were, were, were not brilliant. And I just thought, well, you know, quite often they say, you know, the first one is the hardest. You need to have a second, a follow-on book, and that'll be better. So we did another one. So the first one was called A Passion for Science. The second one, More Passion for Science. Um, uh, I see what you're doing. Oh, yes, yes. I, and then yet more Passion for yet Science. Yet more, even more Passion for Science. I mean, you know, you could go Not another forever. Passion yes. for Science. Um, and... And, and did the same kind of thing. And I, I did always say to my authors, you know, like, if this does take off, then, you know, I'll offer an honorarium. 
and it, it in all honesty never really has so i get uh, the occasional payment from amazon of sort of oh look here's ten dollars and it's simply oh, yeah it's just not it just didn't work as a reliable income stream and i think you know part of the issue there is marketing when you are running a mission driven company you do get sucked into focusing on the mission and things like marketing get put aside particularly if marketing is not natural if it's not something that you enjoy doing so then i moved on and tried merchandising we get a little bit more out of merchandising we use red bubble print on demand i did quite a bit of research and they seem to me to be one of the better print on demand merchandising sites but again it's very very hard to scale that up into a big income stream when you know i'm not a graphic designer and the cost of hiring a graphic designer would probably be more than i'd make from the merchandise so we do have we have a few t-shirts we've got some posters we've got things like notebooks and and that kind of stationery and you you get to a point of okay i would really love to do more merchandise but again it's like if it's not paying for itself then you have to be a little bit ruthless you have to be ruthless you have to acknowledge when something isn't working and try and understand why it's not working and and whether it's worth your time to try and make it work it sounds like the takeaway lesson here is that you just need to keep trying and seeing what fits that your project might be able to get by fantastically on having a patron or having a company back you or having sponsorship. But if that doesn't work, you need to be ready to pivot and look at a different revenue stream to see what fits for you. Absolutely. And, and actually, I do have a Patreon. And again, you know, I mean, it's a little bit weird for us because um, the people who support us on Patreon are people who believe in the mission. And because we're not actually a content producing organization in that I'm, I'm not like uh, producing a web comic or or anything like that I'm not not producing really episodic content in a way that would really gel with the patreon audience again we don't get a huge amount of money from patreon and certainly again not enough to hire a freelancer you know not enough to pay my wages not enough to pay our other expenses so Again, it's a question of, I mean, what you're constantly doing is trying to balance the resources that you have to hand with the potential income stream that you're looking at. So, yes, we could probably do a lot more marketing, but we have a limited marketing budget. And so, you know, if you have a project that isn't growing organically, then you're in a difficult situation when you're at this scale, because, you know, this is very small scale. I am the only full-time employee and you know we're really sort of looking for a way to provide value to the community and I think part of the problem there is as someone who comes from a content background you know I used to work as a journalist and you know I've always been drawn to you know writing my first instinct is always I'll write something you know you you're competing with a vast, vast amount of information out there. There's, there are so many ways people can spend their time. Why would they spend it with your content? And if you can't adequately answer that question, and if you can't hook into a, 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 a large audience that will support you, then content is a very time-consuming and an expensive way to try and create a revenue stream. So we've moved on again from, from content to services and I think this I'm hoping will be the the thing that gives us more financial stability as well as serving our mission serving our audience our community and really doing something valuable which is we are piloting an online careers fair for women in STEM in the UK and to me this what is, a brilliant idea thank you I hope so this sounds like a really interesting opportunity for you to use the market knowledge you've gained working with sponsors and working with STEM organizations as well as the community you've built up around Ada Lovelace Day something that lets you help employers that you've been in contact with but also help these women who you are hoping to spotlight find meaningful work yeah, absolutely. And, and we know that um, when women graduate from university, they are more likely 
to be in employment than their male counterparts, but they are more likely to be in low quality jobs. So basically women are leaving university and they're taking any job that they can find. We know, for example, that women are more judgmental about their own skills. So they won't apply for a job if they don't think they meet every single criteria, whereas men will kind of wing it. And there's all this evidence that we have about a disparity in how people interact with the hiring process and how hiring processes are constructed. And what I'm really hoping to do is kind of short circuit that and say, right, let's get smart women in STEM. Let's just introduce them to employers, let them have one-to-one video conversations online about specific jobs with specific companies so that we're getting past this, the uncertainty and and the the lack of confidence that I think some women feel about, oh, can I really do this job? Hmm, Should I really apply for this? I just need to take something and and I need to be more realistic And, and try and actually get past that and say, yes, you can do this job. Have a chat with a recruiter. Just ignore the bullet points and all the rest of it because the recruiter will be in a much better position to tell you what the job's really all about. And I think that service is something that's really important and it does seem to be something that's really missing. And it's not just for graduates, it's also for anyone who's kind of, you know, looking for their second, third, even fourth jobs, you know, anyone wanting to return to STEM after taking uh, a career break. Because again, you know, we assume that careers advice and career services are for school leavers and maybe graduates. And we kind of ignore everyone else. And it's, it's not really the case that, oh, you know, you, you have graduated. Congratulations. You now know everything there is to know about getting a job. I mean, that's just not true. That's ridiculous. No. And we want to be in, in that space where we can support women and we can, can match make between companies that value diversity and women who want STEM jobs. And I think that to me is a major part of our ambition because it's all well and good inspiring people into STEM. If you can't get them employed in STEM, if you can't get them a good job that they love, you're only doing half your job. What's the point of getting someone into the industry and inspiring them if we're not going to pay them to stick around? Exactly. And I think increasingly I'm seeing companies that are coming to me and saying, look, we we understand diversity is an issue. It's not just uh, an ethical issue. It's also a business issue. We know that diverse teams produce better results. We just don't know how to hire women. We, we don't know how to talk to women. And there's actually, you know, there's a lot of insight and intelligence coming out of, of various places, coming out of activists and research. And we need to put that into action instead of talking about how language affects the gender of the person who gets hired for a particular job. So we know that very masculine language results in a more likely to be a man that gets hired and vice versa. Instead of just talking about that and going, oh, isn't this interesting? You know, we need to actually solve that problem and have companies think about the language of their job ad. So moving past the research and the academic Mm. work and the uh, data points that we already have and saying, that's great, let's just try this and see what works. Absolutely. I I was working with an organization recently who were aware that they were not attracting enough women. And we just did some really simple, basic tweaks to their materials, their marketing materials. um, And they saw a 30%. Well, they went from zero women to 30% women applicants. Oh, I mean, this stuff can have an impact. It really can have a huge impact. And, and the problem is, is, is not that it's difficult. It's actually really, really easy. It's just that people don't have the basic tool set um, to, to do that. And we, we want to change that. We want to make sure that employers understand, okay, you know, if you want to attract women, then you need to think about how you're writing your ads what color if it's a color ad you know in a magazine or online like what colors are you using what images are you using you know what language are you using um yeah how are you constructing your ad is it bullet points or is it a narrative all these things are are really easy to implement Um, and it's just about creating an environment where employers are motivated to make those changes because they see, you know, if we don't, then, you know, this, we just won't attract the right people. We won't attract the best people because ultimately 
that's what it's really about. This is about making sure that the really talented women get interesting, fascinating, rewarding jobs. And STEM is such a, a rewarding you know, there's so many amazing jobs. There's, there's so many exciting and jobs that really make a difference in the world. You know, and we're, we're failing to communicate that. So people still assume that a STEM job is, is, you know, if you're in science, you're in a lab with a white coat looking down a microscope. You know, if you're tech, then you can only be working as a programmer in a startup. And if you're in an en engineer, then you've got a, a hard hat, a high-vis jacket and, and muddy boots. Um, and no one even knows what mathematicians do. So there's not even a stereotype there to bust because <laughs> no one has any clue. Oh, you're a mathematician. Oh. Um, so, you know. Chalkboards. We have, yeah. We have a lot of, um, of work to do in terms of communicating to, to, to women across the ages. You know, I mean, school kids, A-levels, university graduates and, and so on and so forth. So, you know, there, there are some fantastic jobs. In many ways, you know, for me, this is about providing other people with the kind of advice I wish I got when I was at school and university. And I ended up, I did a degree in geology, and I ended up not just out of geology, but out of science completely, really. Uh, I ended up, I was a music journalist for two years. That was fun. Cool. Didn't pay very well, though. Um, and then I got into tech journalism and then web design and, and so on and so forth. And, and I've had a very erratic career to put it mildly. And I think it's really important that we, we don't just abandon women when they graduate, you know, that we provide lifelong support. That's what it's all about. So this is really interesting where you're talking about your own personal career and your own personal progression. It seems very much to echo what you've been saying about what you've been doing with Ada Lovelace Day and Finding Ada, the finding something that fits right now and then growing and exploring different options and moving forward from that point. Um, and it seems like it might be widely applicable it as advice for folks who are looking to have their passion project be their job and pay their bills some days. Come in, commit to your values, iterate on those and find what it is that works for you and try and get someone to pay you what you, what you deserve ideally. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think one of the challenges is um, what I have had to learn, and it has been a hard lesson to learn, is persistence and resilience. Um, I, I was a fairly smart kid and, and I found school easy. Uh, university was not as easy, but certainly kind of like I, it was an environment where the, the challenges were less about the academic side of things and, and for me, more about the social side of things. When I started, re really sort of like started my own, my first business, which was sort of 2001, 2002, and that really kind of crashed and burned as many startups do. It was, it, that was really difficult to, to figure out what went wrong with that and why that didn't work. And because I'd had this sense that things should just work first time and, and if they didn't work first time then clearly it just wasn't possible. It was really hard to get past and with Ada Lovelace Day you know it has been a slow burn. You know it did take seven years for me to get to a point where I could go full time with it. I had enough sponsorship to actually go full time with it and in part that was also because I moved to a, a place where the cost of living was was very low so that really helped but actually the Persistence and resilience are, are really the two most important traits in an entrepreneur. And I think they're traits that are not encouraged in women. You know, you, you get a lot of kind of, oh, they're there, at least you tried. Why don't you go and get a proper job now? Whereas with men, it tends to be much more along the lines of, well, yes, you have to look at, you know, what failed, what went wrong, you know, do some analysis, work out what happened, and then do it better next time. And I think these kind of social messages that are just sort of like embedded in our entire culture they're really hard for women to get over you know it's really difficult to to believe in yourself after you've screwed up well at least once in my case probably twice um and then you know, <laughs> only twice just the two it. times though yeah well you know i mean you see sort of guys who have startup after startup after startup and i kind of feel like wow you know third time lucky but actually third time normal if we're honest. Yeah. 
You know, failed startups are normal. And you're not an entrepreneur unless you've been through at least one. And I think this is the thing is like sort of slow burn, persistence, kind of working out what your revenue streams are, working out what doesn't work and what you can stop doing because you cannot do everything. You know, you, it's just impossible to, everyone will come to you with ideas and, and people do. I constantly, oh, you know, you should really do this thing. And I, That's a great idea. I'll put it on my very, very long list of things that I want to do. And I will prioritize it when I see a revenue stream attached to it. Um, and that is the thing. That's such a fantastic point that people are always going to give you ideas of things that they themselves are not willing to put the work in, but you should totally do. <laughs> you should totally do this thing that will cost you a boatload of cash all of your time and pay you nothing. And, and this is the problem. And, and again, you know, hard lesson learned is actually weighing up opportunities based on whether they'll bring money in. Because it doesn't matter how ethical your organization is, you know, whether it's a charity or, you know, mine's actually just a basic limited company. We are not a charity. Um, and that's for, you know, various reasons around the, the culture of charities and also the legal restrictions on charities. But ultimately, if I can't create a business where I'm paying people for their time, I have no right to call myself a businesswoman. I have no right to be an entrepreneur if I'm not willing to actually put that work in to make sure people are compensated for their efforts. I often like to say that if you don't have the money to pay someone for their work, you don't, you're not in a position to, to ask for their work, I, which is unusual. Yes, <laughs> and it, it is. Um, I mean, in tech. Yeah, absolutely. And I feel very strongly about it. I mean, this doesn't mean I don't accept volunteers. And in fact, you know, I've, I've one woman, um, Lorna, who's worked on Ada Lovelace Day Live, who's been a volunteer, but I'm not actively soliciting volunteers. And I do my best to make sure that my volunteers get value from it in some way. And whether that is, you know, shifting to a paid engagement once the revenue's there, or whether that is some other form of support then, you know, that's fine. But I, I'm very, very keen that there be some form of value exchange. I have no intention of creating a, a huge community of volunteers. So, I mean, you know, I have a very complex relationship to the whole volunteer thing. I mean, sometimes they are necessary and sometimes some, some people just get a great sense of, of achievement from being engaged in something. And I recognize that. But I don't ask for freebies from designers for example. I've had a couple of designers offer, which is cool. But, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a difference between being offered something as a gift and soliciting something as an entitlement. And, and I'll accept the gift, but I try very, very hard not to be that person who feels entitled to help because their mission is, is ethical and, and valuable and, and social good and all that. Fantastic. So it sounds like the last takeaway you're going to offer is one of the most fundamental ones is if you're going to make your passion project your job, you need to make sure it's an actual job, that it's a business model that's tested, that's ver that you've found that works and it's something that's going to pay you. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it really is. It's like always be looking for the revenue. You know, you, you just cannot you cannot create a business if you don't know where the money is coming from. You know, and this is one of the big things about female-led businesses, actually, is that it's much, much harder for women to raise money. And so most women end up bootstrapping their business over long periods of time. You know, if you're in a job, stay in the job, you know, build your business up um, to the point where you feel confident financially taking the leap into full time. We end up with businesses that are more robust because we have to, because it's impossible pretty much to just dip into this pool of VC money that most male-led startups seem to benefit from. And, you know, when you look at the statistics for how many VCs are women, how many women get VC money or angel money, you know, it's very clear that there is a bias there. So as a woman... Um, you have to do it the hard way, the slow way. But ultimately, I think that's good for your business because I think it makes you really focus on, you know, what is the value that we bring? Where is the money coming from? What is the revenue? What are our outgoings? What is essential? What isn't? We don't have an office and we probably, it's going to be years yet before I would spend money on an office because we can work perfectly well remotely. 
and an office is a, an unnecessary expense. I don't even hire a co-working space. You know, I, I work in my spare bedroom. So, you know, you try and keep the costs down. Sue, thank you so much. You've given us incredible insight into where Ada Lovelace Day came from, your own personal journey, and some really applicable lessons through your experiences about how we need to, if we're interested in doing our own thing, making our project, how we need to test out different things to get that to pay and really apply business logic to that. Thank you for joining us. Oh, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for, for the conversation. It's, it's actually been... Um, interesting for me to think about it in these terms because it's something I don't often do. So thank you.